So back in Nepal, there was a guy in Gama, in the village called Binod. And Binod worked in the construction company with Nick and everyone else. And he'd also spent, I think, up to like eight years working overseas, which was the main problem for parents in this village, this rural village in the mountains of Nepal, that they couldn't find much work locally. So I think he spent probably a number of those years in Dubai and the others in Saudi Arabia. After two years working in Nick's construction company, Binod came to him and asked if he could stop working. This man in this community with not much employment opportunity. Now, the reason is that Binod had made enough money to afford to uh, rebuild his house. And he also had a little gas bottle business on the side, which was enough to kind of tie him over and he didn't have to work full time on. So now that he had rebuilt his home, he came to Nick and asked if it'd be okay if he then stopped working because he didn't see the point in working anymore because he had everything he needed, everything he wanted. He just wanted to spend more time with his family. That story is very, very simple, but it has always stuck with me. Welcome back to the With Joe Weeby podcast. This is part two of the Minimum Viable Lifestyle. And we're doing this as part of the big three to start off the podcast. Um, We did talk about a bunch of stuff in part one, so you can go back. All these episodes are made in order, so feel free to go back and listen to them all the way through so that makes sense. Now back to Binod. Why this story stuck with me so much and what it has to do with MVL? Well, for me, it's it's MVL in a nutshell. Because something Binod understood was the difference between needs and wants. So take a second to flip this story on its head and put Binod in a different scenario where he's in the West, where he's in a Western country where I'm from Australia or the US or Europe or anywhere like that. Now, in that sort of cultural environment, once someone like that starts doing well and makes enough money to rebuild their home, starts showing progress, everyone around them will start telling them to go out on their own, start your own business. Don't work on Nick's clock or someone else's clock, work on your own build that business up, scale it, make more of yourself, be the most. Now, if you remember the question we like to ask with the minimum viable lifestyle is, wow, well, what's the least my life could be? Now for Binod, there was no point or logic behind spending more time on work when he already had everything he needed. To us, in the West, it might seem illogical. It might seem counterintuitive, like throwing away the hand that feeds you. But when you actually look at it, it makes perfect sense. And you start to question who's got it figured out the right way. Another story I love, which I also put in the blog post on this, on the website, is something a bit more different, a lot more relatable. Um, is the comedian Joey Coco Diaz, which you might not, you might think that's funny for those of you, those of you who know Uncle Joey, uh, you might think it's funny to bring him up here. But apart from his very entertaining, comical, and uh, you know, rough around the edges style and persona, he's got some important lessons I think for us. And on his podcast, there's an episode I love, which is called money will come fall in love with something first and in it he talks a bit about getting onto the path of comedy now he had a very rough life and he (laughs) was in and out of some bad stuff like drugs and whatever else but he found one of the things in his life that he loved and he wanted to commit to was comedy now comedy is not a step one step two nice and easy cozy uh, profession necessarily especially if you're starting out with nothing, as he was. 
So what he decided he was going to do was commit 10 years to being broke in order that he could just double down on his dream. He realized he had a lot of clarity over the fact that comedy was what he wanted to do. He was 31 years old and he said, I'm going to be broke for 10 years. I'm not going to spend more time working to pay my bills, whatever. I'm going to sleep on couches or wherever I can in order that I might do the thing that I love. And he didn't care what that meant. He didn't care what comforts comforts he had to sacrifice or give up for his dream. Now, that's not advice for everyone. That's not something that everyone needs to do. Everyone is different, but it's a great example of how the minimum viable lifestyle helps you set your priorities in order. He was willing to be broke for 10 years. Up until he was 41, he decided that at the age of 31. I'm 26 now, so as a young person, that gives me great perspective about how I prioritize what and when. So that's this is some of the things when I unpack more this framework. I talked about myself a bit more specifically in part one. Here, I guess we should talk about more of the mechanics behind this framework, right? So there's the question, what is the least my life could be? There's also another question which is really helpful, which is what is the least income you need to survive on that your comfort and survival needs are met? That life's not bad. You're not scraping by. It's comfortable. It's good. All your basic needs are met. How much income is that actually? And they're not just income, but remember I talked about how the best thing about my lifestyle for now, touch wood, I'm able to sustain it continually, is a lot of is the freedom. Is the ability to spend my time on things I love spending my time on. I view that as a very unique gift. I don't see that in everyone I know here, despite the material comforts of Western society. So it's not just about income, but that's a very important place to start is knowing your threshold for what income is the minimum you need. So I always say the easiest way to break this down is to think about the three parts of a minimum viable lifestyle. They're easy to remember. They're in the name. Minimum, viable, part three is the lifestyle. Okay. Now we talked a lot about the minimum before, right? It's what's the least because asking what's the most is a bit hard because what's the most you could get paid? Well, there, will, there might always be someone willing to pay you a little bit more. But what do you give up? But it's also not just the least because if it's the least, well, I guess I could live on a pack of sardines every day, Joe, and sleep on the street. So that's not really that's not really comfort. We do we do like to be comfortable. So that's why it's got to be step two, viable, of course. And that's for everyone to judge for themselves. So Binod and Joey Diaz have a different standard of viable than you or I. That's fine. Doesn't mean we have to do that. I certainly don't intend on doing that. Part three is that it's a lifestyle. So this is something when I talk to my dad about this concept. He's like, well, it's all good that you can live on very little, but what if you want to have a family one day and that's going to cost more? And it's like, ah, well, yeah, of course. I mean, that's why it's important to know your MVL. So that you know how much you actually do need to make. Um, because it's a lifestyle. It's not the minimum viable income. It's not just figuring out what I need to make next year. It's also figuring out how do I need to live next year? What's the least I need to do of all the things I care about that in balance things will be pretty good. So the conversation we're having is comfort versus meaning. Now, if you remember last episode, I talked about my experience in Nepal, right? The cramped toilet seat, the shower, it was too hot and had a weak stream. Comfort and meaning don't correlate in a very obvious way. We're going to spend a lot of time in this in the series to come on how we're wired and meaning uh, discussing that. But this is something I've come to realize, thankfully, due to the experiences in Nepal, that a lot of Western culture is optimized for comfort, but not 
at all for meaning. What I mean by that is once you've got a house and you're off the street, life is pretty good. It's really worthwhile working hard to get that house so that there's a roof over your head. But when you upgrade a smaller house to a bigger house, life doesn't improve as much as going from being homeless to into the small house. It's diminishing returns. It's only so comfortable you can be that it impacts your deep what is life all about, sense of meaning and purpose and happiness. It's very, very, they, they, they do diverge at a point. We're going to talk about that with the comfort ladder and Maslow's hierarchy of needs to come. Um, but for those who are aware of Maslow's already, you'll see how this all starts to relate. So this is the whole point about understanding the difference between comfort and meaning. Nepal, where I stayed with Nick, uh, it probably would have got, got to my nerves long if I'd been there longer than two weeks, kind of. It wasn't comfortable, but it was incredibly meaningful. Why? A lot of the things we do to optimize for comfort come at the cost of meaning. And a lot of the things that make life more meaningful sacrifice unnecessary levels of comfort. You might be earning more than $100,000 a year at the moment, 150, 200 millions. Um, but does it make sense if you're trading all your time and you don't actually have freedom and control of your time? Would you be better off earning half, a quarter, an eighth of what you're earning now and have more freedom to do the things that align with you? Joey Diaz thought so. Binod, Binod thought so. So it's this, it's this very interesting conversation between our needs and our wants. Because what you'll find is the things that you feel like you need, like I need to spend a lot of my time doing writing and creative projects. Because otherwise, when I'm not in that lifestyle where I get to do those things, I look at my time just being spent on low return things. I can't live with myself. So... The last word we can talk about here is clarity. Understand your minimum viable lifestyle so you get a sense of clarity. What's important to you? So let's recap what we've talked about here just quickly. We've given some examples, but basically we're trying to point out the difference between comfort and meaning needs and wants and then finally clarity and i think what we'll do is we'll do one more we'll do a part three to this next and i want to concentrate more on the clarity so for now i just want to say thank you for tuning into part two of the minimum viable lifestyle just remember, uh, all the resources will be on the blog and the website for the blog and the podcast is www.withjoeweeby.com. And as usual, my takeaway is always to remember as we go through this that we are on a journey to open doors, but that the best way to open doors for you is to concentrate on opening doors for others. Thank you.